And so our Heavenly Father, we thank you today that grace always flows from you to us and from us to others. What a wonderful principle that is. I pray, Father, that the church would be diversified in ages. You know, not just old, but young. Not just young, but old. Not just male, but female. Not just female, but male. Not just Greek, but Greek. Not just Jew, but Jew. To have that diversification, Father, not just black and white, to have the combination, Father, of conversions. I pray today, Fathers, we look at spiritual gifts because it is the modus operandi of this church. We believe that is everything. We believe that it is the absolute program of the local church, the body of Christ. It is the function of spiritually gifted ministries. I pray you would teach us this today as you have so faithfully taught us over the years. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll go back with me to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, we're looking at verses 1, 2, and 3. 1, 2, and 3. In verse 1, we, we, we talked last time, this, this phrase, now concerning... Really important. That's really important. Paul uses it in a specific way. What you might not realize is that it's made up of two Greek words, day and peri. Day and peri. The word now is day. It's a conjunction. And it's, it's a very interesting conjunction. I'll talk about it. I might as well talk about it. It's an explanatory conjunction. It is used here. It can be used in a lot of different ways. But it's used here as an explanatory because remember this. The section that Paul is writing on goes from chapter 7 through 15. I think I've, I'm going to make, make mention of it again in point 1. He's writing, the congregation has written him about questions pertaining to how Christians deal with Christians, how, how you deal with people living in the church that you go to church with on a regular basis. And they were having problems, in, in, and so he writes on the questions of problems they were having dealing with one another. Chapter 7 through 15, we're dealing with one of those sections called spiritual gifts. This is chapters 12, 13, and 14. That's the whole background to this subject matter. That's really important you understand it. So when he comes to chapter 12, you remember he used this phrase, in chapter 7, verse 1, in verse 25, and every time he does, he's changing his subject matter. It's used to change subject matter. He uses, uses the day on the front of it, an explanatory particle, meaning I'm changing my subject. Stay with me, I'm changing the subject. He does it in chapter 7, verse 1, chapter 7, 25, 8, 1, and 12, 1. See, that's all in our section. So it's, it's a very important phrase because every time you see this word now concerning, he's changing a subject that they wrote about and what he's using is categorical doctrine to resolve their problems. Categorical Bible doctrine to resolve their problems that they're having one with another. It's, it's an enormous passage of study, chapter 7, verse 1 through the end of chapter 15. The word concerning, the word concerning is peri plus the genitive of reference. It's called the genitive of reference. And so he puts these together and it, he uses it to change a subject matter on specifically what they wrote about to give them a doctrinal answer. Are you with me? 
I can only tell you how he did it. <laughs> he does it in chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the matters about which he wrote, he did it in chapter 7, verse 25. He did it in chapter 8, 1. He did it in chapter 12, 1. That's in our section. Okay? So this, he's in our section. I chose to pick out one section to study, chapters 12, 13, and 14, now concerning spiritual gifts. All right? So it's important that you understand the background to this. Why do I teach on spiritual gifts every year? Because they're the whole functional program of the local church. Every church has programs. This one's, every, all of our programs run off of spiritual gifts. If the gift doesn't work and the growth is not willing to work, we scratch it. No matter what the program is. If the spiritual gift is not going to do it, and spiritual growth is not going to do it, we scratch it. We don't run it. Because, listen, the last thing we need is human programs run by human energy and think we're going to have spiritual results. When you read chapter 12, there is no doubt about it. He says the local church body is made up of members like a body, like a human body. You have arms, you have eyes, you have ears, you have things you can see and things you can't see, lungs, heart, kidneys. It makes up the body function. They are all necessary. One gift is not more important than the other. They all work in conjunction to make the body good or healthy. When one fails, the body suffers. You have start having heart congestions and heart problems. The body, the other parts of the body suffer from it. I live with that in my family. And Paul uses this illustration. He, in chapter 12, verses 12 through 27, well worth your read, talks about how spiritual gifts make up the body of believers of a local church. There is no such thing, if, you're, if, you're, if you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, you have a spiritual gift. That spiritual gift is for the body, uh, the local body of the church. Is your gift local? Is it in you? Do you have a mailing address? Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? That spiritual gift helps the rest of the body. It's not, your gift is not for you. It's for others. The body, it's as important the heart is, the body's not made up of a heart. As important as the heart is, as important as the kidneys are, the body's not a kidney. Nobody says, hi, kidney, how you doing? No, it's a body it has a function to the body. And so that's very important to us. Now, the problem with, that the church of Corinth was having wasn't that they didn't know about spiritual gifts. They knew about spiritual gifts. It wasn't that they didn't know what spiritual gifts were functional. They knew there was the gift of this and the gift of that and the gift of this and the gift of that. That wasn't their problem. Their problem was it wasn't functioning properly. Gifts weren't functioning properly. They were having problems. People were making big deals out of some gifts and not out of the others. They were, they were saying that some gifts are really important and other gifts aren't. He says that's foolishness. Every gift is important to the body. It takes every gift functioning in the body to make it a body, to make it a healthy body. So in the chapter 13, writing on the subject matter, by the way, in verse 11, he says, when I was a child, an apios, an immature child, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child, but when I became a man, notice the word he used there is anair. He's talking about an adult man. He's talking about an adult. 
He's not talking about a spiritual person. He's talking about a chronological person in theory. Here's a child that's uh, like, a, like a teenager, it, growing to be an adult, but not yet an adult. Teenagers, adolescence is a terrible place. You're not a, ch you're not a child, and you're not an adult. And so you're considered immature. When you become an adult, taking adult responsibility, you're called an anair. This is not the word teleos. When I became a man, I did a way, when I become fully grown and taking responsibility for my behaviors and my life, making my choices, I did a way, I did a way with or it means to do away with, it means to render inactive or to abolish childish things. When I, when I became an a heir, when I became an adult, taking adult responsibilities and choices, becoming responsible for the choices I was making, you see. And listen, when you read it in context, which is verse 11 through 13, or 8 through 13, the context is that he's discussing that certain gifts are going to be done away with and cease. Isn't that interesting? And they were fussing about all that. They were acting childish about it rather than being adults. They were acting childish rather than acting like adults with some in their speaking and in their thinking and in their reasoning. Well, see, this is chapter 12, 13, and 14. It goes together under the phrase, now concerning things about which you wrote, see. Now, let me remind you, we talked about this last time, point one. Remember, Paul divided the contents of the entire book of 1 Corinthians into four sections. It really helps you when you study Corinthians to know this. I'm looking at one section of that. I'm doing a study, 12, 13, and 14, on it. When, you get, when I get you through with this, you're going to have a pretty good understanding of spiritual gifts. And let me tell you something. You have one. You got it at the point of salvation. You may not know it, but you have one. And we'll, we'll certainly discuss it with you. So there's the Chloe source, chapters 1 and 4. There's the leaders of the church source in 5.1. Questions in 7-1 that goes through 15, my section, and Paul's personal ministry source in chapter 16, verse 1. You're going to find something very important with them. They all have now concerning. Notice that spiritual gifts fall under the questions from the congregation. That's really important. Chapter 7, 8, 9, all the way through 15. That's the background to all those discussions in there. And there's a marvelous discussion in there. Point number two. When Paul wrote chapters 12, 13, and 14, he wrote to answer specific questions from the congregation regarding the functional or application side of gifts. It wasn't that they didn't know about gifts. It wasn't that they didn't know what gifts were available. It wasn't that they didn't know that some gifts would, would cease and some would be done away with. They knew all that. When he writes, he writes to remind them. That wasn't their problem. Their problem was the application of the knowledge of what they had. They didn't take gnosis to epinosis. Unfortunately, they took it to agnosia. without knowledge. They took it to a place of failure not in knowing, of failure in applying what they knew to be the truth. In the way they dealt with one another. We are, we are in the matter of the seventh chapter, verse 1, now concerning the things about which you wrote. And so he wrote chapter 7 through 15 to doctrinally 
categorically correct the problems they were having in the local church. In this study, chapters 12, 13, and 14, we are only focusing on specific problems they were having regarding spiritual gifts. Remember, they wasn't on the side of knowing, it was the side of applying. Paul opens new doctrinal subjects with this special phrase, now concerning. They are found a lot in the sections 7 through 15, which I mentioned to you. It's very interesting about this conjunction day. What you miss with conjunctions in the Greek language, conjunctions are really important. If you spend any time in the Greek language, you will know that conjunctions, the ands and the buts and the nows and this, let me tell you what a conjunction does, and you need to know this. If you have a simple Greek grammar book or an advanced one like Summers or an advanced one like Dante, Dante, you will find this common idea about a subjunction. This is what a subjunction does. I wrote this down. It's a turning point or a direction of thought. It's a turning point. For example, he might use the word Allah in contrast. You were doing this way, but you got to do it this way. You're doing it this way, and that's all wrong, but you got to do it this way, it'll correct it. It's a turning point. It is a turning point or a, a direction of thought that needs to be made. Now concerning this little word day can be translated a lot of different ways. It can be and or but or translated now. He used now concerning to change subject matters. Just a wonderful Pauline principle of the Greek grammar. You need to know that. You need to know that. And listen, this is not difficult. This is 101 Greek. I'm not telling you something that is out there in advanced ideas. This is 101. This is simple Greek. And so I tell you that. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. That's the word nosa with alpha privative on the front. Ignorant. It's gnosis, the word knowledge, with the alpha privative, A on the front of it, means without knowledge. It's not that they weren't without knowledge of gifts. It was They had been taught. They, they sat under two of the great teachers of their day, Paul and Apollos. In chapter 3, Paul talks about how privileged this church has, has been that they've had two, two of the great new covenant teachers in their church teaching them. But listen, even then the church was full of problems. They had two of the great pastor teachers of their day. And it wasn't that they weren't being taught the truth. It was they weren't applying it. They weren't applying it. They were learning and not applying. And this was a great little church like yours and mine. So now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. See the word agonio? That's the verb. It's a present active infinitive, second person plural, speaking to the congregation at large. The A means without, and gnosis is knowledge. It means misinformed or misunderstanding. It takes correct categorical Bible doctrine to correct the problems. That's what Paul is doing. That's chapters 12 through 15. Our subject matter, chapters 12, 13, 14. Now, here's what I expect you to do as good students. I expect you to do your homework. Do you know what your homework would be? Read chapters 12, 13, and 14. Right? That's the subject I'm teaching for the next few weeks. 
It will serve you well to do your homework. You should read this. I told you this is where I'm going to be. I'm going to be here for several weeks. It'll do you good. Read it every, read it every week. Read chapters 12, 13, and 14. It's not going to take you long. Come on. Time your coffee's ready to drink, it'll, you have read it, you know? That's your homework. You should do this. You're a student of the word. You should do that. You should do that. You should do that. Point number three. Remember that the Greek word gift in chapter 12, verse 1, is not in the original text. Therefore, in your Bible, it should be either italics or omitted, or footnoted. Because it's not in the Greek text. Now, when you find something in italics, you have to go to the context to see if it's there. So when it's italics, like in chapter 12, verse 1, the word gift is in italics. They added it and put it in parentheses or in italics to tell you that it's found in the context. The context. What is the context? Chapters 12, 13, and 14. When you read chapters 12, 13, and 14, the subject is spiritual gifts. Every bit of the subject is spiritual gifts. So they tell you that right off the bat. They tell you that the subject is spiritual gifts. And if you doubt that, just read chapters 12, 13, and 14 because it's all about spiritual gifts and function. The function of spiritual gifts and the problems they were creating in the Corinthian church. The Greek word, the Greek word, Tan and pneumatikos is the word spiritual. It's a definite article. The word T-O-N is a definite article in the Greek language. He's talking about the spiritual, and they italicize gifts because that's what 12, 13, 14 is about, because that's the greater context of now concerning. Right. Now, look. I see your eyes starting to glaze over. All right? I'm telling you what Paul wrote. <laughs> Are we studying the Word of God? Then go, don't go to sleep on me. I'm just telling you what Paul wrote. Because he wrote this so that you might know the truth and the truth would set you free. Do you have a spiritual gift? You may not know it, but do you have one? Absolutely you have one. Look, are you a body? <laughs> Does your body have parts? Paul said, if you're a member of the church, and you are, the moment you believe you're baptized into Christ, Look, let me tell you, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you're baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, 27, 20, 26 through 28 tell you you're baptized into the body of Christ, the church. At the moment of salvation, you are baptized into Christ, seated at the right hand of God the Father. That's positional sanctification. At the same time, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. At the same time you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into the church by the Holy Spirit. You become a member of the local church by the grace of God, not because you joined it. You can't join it. The moment you believe the gospel, you were baptized into the body of Christ. You will always be a member of the body of Christ, whether you ever join to be a part of one or not. Someplace in your spiritual growth, you should be able to find a church where your gift would work, and when it doesn't work, you'd be in a church where the pastor could teach you how to resolve those problems by the word of God. 
not picking on you or harassing you. That he's able to teach you by the principle of grace. So this word, tan pneumatikos, is really important. The I-K-O-S is really important. You ought to circle that. That's a suffix to the word spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, and he, he added in the Greek language a suffix of belonging. Spiritual gifts, our subject, belongs to the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. When you find what your gift is, it must operate by the indwelling, filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, or it doesn't work. It doesn't work in the flesh. It works in the spirit. The gift belongs to the Holy Spirit. It functions under the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells you. It's called a spiritual gift for that reason. It belongs to the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who distributes to you at salvation, and it is he, under the filling ministry, causes the function of it. The function operates by him. He makes the heart work. He makes the liver work. He makes them work. It's a divine source of power. I mean, which one of you sit around and think about your spleen and how it functions? Until you have some kind of problem with it, and you go to a doctor, he says, you got a problem with your spleen. You say, well, how do I fix it? If you don't sit around and think, how about that, until you have a problem with it, and then you go try to get it fixed. Now it becomes an issue because it's become a problem. I want you to know that your gift and the way it functions is all spiritual, and it needs to function that way. When you have problems with it, that's because of carnality. It's because of flesh. It's not because of the Holy Spirit. You will never have a problem with your function of your gift, the identity of your gift, in the Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit who distributes it. It is He who functions it. 1 Corinthians 12.4 there, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Holy Spirit. In verse 7 of chapter 12, it says that your gift is for the common good of the body. Your gift is not for you. It's not to make you out to be somebody. Your gift, does, your gift is not to promote you. It's not to promote the gift. It's to promote the Lord Jesus Christ and to make the body good, healthy, sound, spiritually. That's verse 7. It's the, it is for the good of the body. The good of the body. And in verse 11, he says, he's the one who distributes it. He's the one who distributes it. Now let's look at verse 4. One great doctrinal truth that you can learn from this lesson is that every church-age believer receives a spiritually gifted ministry, a spiritually gifted ministry at the point of salvation and it's given to him by the Holy Spirit of God. You don't ask for it. You can't, you can't trade it in for another. You got to learn to know how it functions. And then under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, let it do its work. It's a divine source. Did you realize that receiving a gift, a spiritually gifted ministry at the point of salvation is one of eight works of the Holy Spirit at salvation. Did you know that? Listen, if you've been here a year, you should not only know it, but you should have it in the back of your Bible somewhere. When you say that to somebody, and somebody says to you, where does it say that in the Bible? That you could at least go to the back of your Bible until you get it solidly and show it to them in the Bible by having a scripture by it. Wouldn't that be good? Because listen, 
That's a 101 spiritual growth. This is, this is baby stuff. Now, nah, look, I can't help it that you've never heard it before. I can't help it that nobody's ever taught you. It's no excuse now because I'm teaching it. Quit telling me, well, I never heard that before. How about, how about saying, well, I finally heard it? Yeah. I st quit talking about where your failure was and start to talk where your success can be. Well, I've never heard that before. Well, quit hiding behind that door. That's not feeding you. Quit hiding behind that door so I never heard that before. You have now. Listen to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verse 11. One and the same spirit. Isn't that interesting he would use two of those words? One and the same spirit. You know why he does that? Because everybody has the one and the same Holy Spirit. You received him at salvation and you have him. He did eight works in your life that you should know about and you should appreciate God's grace for giving it to you because these days you don't earn or deserve. You don't earn them or deserve them for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift to God. These are gifts. It's amazing to me that you don't know these eight. You know, you got to know them. To, you got to have gnosis to have epinosis. Well, I'll tell you where you can pick them up. The little pamphlet back there says 50 things you receive at salvation you're going to lose in time and eternity. Pick one up on your way out and actually read it. Because <laughs> there's a section here that says eight works of the Holy Spirit at salvation. You should certainly know that. How long have you been a believer and you don't know that? This is baby stuff. This is 101. Now, I'm not being critical of you because you're here. But listen, just because you hear, hear me say it, don't make it, don't make it believable to you. You need to search it out. You need to believe it. You can't run on my faith. You've got to run on your own. But you certainly need to know this stuff. One in the same spirit, watch, works. All these things. What's he talking about? What chapter am I in? 12th chapter, verse 11. Chapter 12, 13, 14 is all about what? Spiritual gifts. The one and the same Holy Spirit that you have, I have. And he works every spiritual gift the same way. He does the work. Who, who does the work? The one and same Holy Spirit that we all have. Isn't that good? So let me give you an inside secret. Let me give you an inside secret. When you walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5.16, the gift will automatically work, whether you know it or not. So you ought to circle that word, work, because it's a grace word. It's a grace word. That word, work, is a grace word. The one and same Holy Spirit works all the gifts. All these things. Yeah. Watch. Distributing. The one same Holy Spirit distributes to each believer a spiritual gift at the point of salvation. Distributing. 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 To each one individually. He doesn't do it in a big meeting. He does it in a private meeting called salvation when he distributes individually. The moment you become a member of the body of Christ, Galatians 3, 26 through 28, baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, you are given a spiritual gift that identifies your ministry to that body. Do you understand that? This. That's what Paul says. They did, they weren't getting that. They weren't getting that straight. They were 
some who had the gift of tongues were saying, boy, if you don't have the gift of tongues, you don't have anything. They were wrong. They were trying to push other... Listen, the church is multi-gifted, not one gifted. The church that's multi-gifted gifted is a healthy church. The gift is mono-gifted. One gift fits all. That church is apostate. It's apostate to the new covenant. Here's 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit... Notice how he keeps emphasizing that. For by one spirit, we were all or some? All baptized. All baptized. All baptized. By what? Baptized by what? The Holy Spirit. He doesn't do it one way today and another way tomorrow. By one spirit, we are all... We are baptized. We were all baptized into what? One body. That's the church. The, the church. It doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether you're a slave or free. We were what? All made to drink of one spirit. You want to know what he means? Read John 7, 37 through 39 later. You have this artesian well in you. It satisfies your thirst and the thirst of others. Did you realize that the entire Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three of them are involved in the distribution and function of your gift? All three members of the Godhead. Now, anytime you find all three members of the Godhead involved in something, it's a big deal. It's a big deal in the plan of God. When we, next week, when we come back and we read verses 4, 5, and 6, you're going to see all members, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three involved in spiritual gifts. All three. Now, up to today, you've not taken seriously your spiritual gift. But I'm telling you, it's a bigger deal than what you thought. It's a big deal. It involved all three members of the Godhead. That's a big deal. And Paul's going to make a big deal out of it next week. And he's going to make a big deal out of it because it is the one body. You are baptized into what one spirit baptizes you into one body. That body is Christ. That is the church. The body of Christ is the church. In 1 Peter 4.10, he's talking about spiritual gifts. I want you to circle two words. Then we're going to take a break. See the word as on the front of that? See the word as? Circle that. And it, it, next to that word is kathos. See kathos? K-A-T-H-O-S. I want that as right there. Now, see the word H-O-S, hos? Write the word. I didn't put it there. It should have the word as. In front of that should be the word as. Just put it underneath. Put it as. You see that, Billy? You looked at 1 Peter 4? See, there's two as, isn't there? Yeah, but they're different. See, there's two as, but they're different in the Greek language. The first as is kathos. It's a comparative clause. Introduces a comparative clause. And the last one, hos, is a introduces a comparative phrase. Now, I don't know that you could tell that. Did you know that by reading the word as? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. But I want you to know that's elementary Greek. This is not difficult. The word as. Now listen to what he says. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another. As each one 
received a spiritual gift, do what with it? How did you get the gift? At salvation, by grace. Distributed by the Holy Spirit, not by you. Right? And, and, it, and it's for you forever. Now, what is the purpose of it in your life? Why did he give you it? Why did he give it? Is anybody in here? Do not, I'm, not, I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to ask you that question. Do you, do you know that everybody that believes the gospel of Christ in the church age has a gift? That's a given. That's a no-brainer. That's elementary, dear Watson. Now, here's the point. As each one has what? Received. Received. You didn't earn it, didn't deserve it. You didn't work for it. You didn't sit on a corner and, you understand, you didn't beg for it. Listen, you received it. As each one received by the grace of God, a spiritual gift ministry for the body of Christ. Do what with it? See, you received it. Is that, is that not a clear? You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't achieve it. You received it. Right? You received it. Now what are you to do? Employ it. Employ it. Doing what? What's it say? Serving others. Your gift is not to serve you. It's to serve others. It's to serve the other members of the body of Christ so that it can be a healthy, wholesome, good body. Notice that. As you have received, employ it in serving one another. As, as, watch this now, as, as good stewards. The reason they changed it in the Greek language is that once you receive it and understand that you're to employ it. See, the problem was they, they understood, the Corinthian church understood they received the gift but they were failing in the employment of it. Because the Holy Spirit that gives it to you has to function it, has to employ it. Your responsibility, your responsibility is to walk in the Spirit and let the Holy Spirit, listen, employ it in serving others. This results in you being a good steward, a good steward of the, man, watch this now, of the manifold, 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 manifold. How many times do you use that in your conversation every week? Manifold. What's a manifold? Well, you could have 30-fold, you could have 60-fold, you could have 100-fold. It depends on whether or not you want to be a good steward. A good steward is one who understands he has received the Holy Spirit and is willing to, by the Holy Spirit, and is willing to employ it by the ministry of the Holy Spirit to serve other people and not themselves. By that, you are a good steward, exemplifying the manifold grace of God. You give it to other people. You employ that to other people, not because they deserve it, not because they've earned it, not because they appreciate it, because you appreciate what God has done in your life, and you give it to them by grace. They don't earn it, they don't, and you don't take it back from them because you're mad at them. You understand that? And when you, when you begin to employ what you receive on a grace basis, you will be a good student of the manifold grace of God. The Corinthian church had failed in that. The Corinthian church was failing in the employment side, the application side, and therefore was, was hindering the manifold grace of God to function in that body of Christ on the basis of grace. 
All right, we're going to stop and take a break so you can breathe again. Okay? We're going to take the offering. We'll take a 15-minute break after the offering. Donuts and coffee downstairs. And come back, and I'm going to show you how to fix the problem. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister, Father, to our hearts to give with a joyful spirit. We're not under law. We're under grace. We thank you, Father, for bringing this meal on a grace basis to these who have come. I pray the Holy Spirit would give us great wisdom how to use the money honorably within the church body and outside the church body to serve, Father, the gospel of Christ on a basis of grace to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been just studying this idea where Paul says that they were ignorant, ignorant, uh, without, without knowledge, but they, not knowledge on, on the learning side, but lack of knowledge on the living side. So I want you to, I want to try to show this under point number five on your paper, <clears throat> try to explain this to you. I, it doesn't take much because once you learn doctrine and you, you, you realize it's supposed to be applied, then you have difficulty applying it, then you're going to understand what, he, what the problem was in the church. Point number five, the Corinthian church didn't lack spiritual gifts or great Bible teachers such as Paul and Apollos who taught on it. You can read about that in the third chapter of Corinthians. What they lacked was practical wisdom. What they lacked was the practical application side of the function of gifts to the body. When you read chapter 12, 13, and 14, you will begin to get, get the picture much better on that. What the, and So what I did is I took the faith cycle down to show you where, where their failure was. Notice between hearing and believing you know, you look at this clockwise, you hear, you believe, you apply, you complete. That's clockwise the way that works, faith, how the faith cycle works. What I want you to do is I want you to draw a line between uh, the hearing and completing and believing and applying side. Just draw a line through there so that on one side of the line you have hearing and believing. On the other side you have applying and completing. Okay? Just draw a line through there. On one side of the line, it says hearing and believing. On the other side, it says applying and completing. Therefore, you see that on the one side is gnosis. They had knowledge. It wasn't that they lacked knowledge. Um, for example, and it wasn't that they, they lacked gifts. It, this little church, Paul, Paul brags on them in 1 Corinthians. We talked about this earlier. Not today, but in one seven, in First Corinthians one seven, he says, in First Corinthians one seven, Paul says, "So that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ." When he says awaiting the revelation, he's talking about the second coming. The spiritual gifts, the great function of spiritual gift, is between the first coming and second coming of Christ. It is the church age. And the body of Christ, the local church, all over the local churches all over the world, are the same in that they have all are gifted by the Holy Spirit to function in a similar manner. <laughs> Next week you'll see it when he says, the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He'll show you that. The, the unity among the Godhead is the, is, the, uh, is the same thing in the body of Christ, the unity. Now, this little church at Corinth, I say little church, the church at Corinth <clears throat> didn't, didn't lack gifts, didn't lack information. They had, they had superb teachers that taught them. And this is a big deal. 
to both Paul and Apollo, spiritual gifts were a big deal, as it is with me and in most churches. So therefore, it's not about that they lack gifts in their understanding. They, didn't, they, they understood they had the gifts. They understood that the gifts were functioning, but they were having problems with them. They were having all sorts of problems with the functional side of gifts. And therefore, Paul calls it, over there, he calls it, see, on the other side, he have gnosis on one side is the word knowledge. On the other side, see the A-G-N-O-S-I-A? -S see, A on the front of that word is without. It means without, without gnosis. Uh, it's just a different form of the ending. One ends in the I-S, the other end the I-A. It's the same thing. It's just a different form. But it's the same word. It's a different form. Let me show you a place. In 1 Peter 2, in 1 Peter 2.15, if you'll go to there for a moment, let me just show you this word uh, used in 1 Peter to give you an idea of what Paul is dealing with, 2.15. He says, For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. See the word ignorance? That's our word that is used here. Listen, such is the will of God, this is how the word of God works. You have the word of God takes you to the will of God that takes you to the work of God. He says, for such is the will of God that in doing right, doing right in regard to what? The will of God. Knowing the will of God and then doing the will of God is doing right. You may silence the ignorance of, of foolish men. Now, if you if you talked to many of them, like Billy was sharing with me this week on the job, you'll find that out. It won't take you but a heartbeat in explaining the truth. It will bring out the foolishness that people you go like, well, how could you possibly believe that? The point I'm trying to make is that the will of God brings you to doing right. That's the application side of the will of God. It's one thing to know the will of God. It's another thing to do it, isn't it? Knowing the will of God is the gnosis side. Doing the will of God, listen to me, is the epinosis side. Epinosis. Gnosis has got to be taken to epinosis. They weren't taking it to epinosis. They weren't taking it. That's why they were having a great deal of problems. Doing right. The will of God brings you to a place of doing right. You know the will of God, you do the will of God. That's what's right. It don't matter how you feel. It don't matter what the service is. Well, but boy, if you knew what they did, I don't need to, to know your responsibility. I don't know. I don't have to know what they did to know what your responsibility is, right? Your responsibility is not to react all the time. Is to respond to the truth, not to react, not to react, not to react, to respond to the truth that's in you. Hold the line. Hold the line. Okay. Now, another place this idea of doing right, the will of God brings you to a place of doing the will of God, brings you to uh, James. Back up to me to James a moment. I don't know if I, I don't think I put these on your paper. You probably should write 1 Peter 2.15 and James 4.16 and 17. In verse 17, he says, and they, they were in a, a problem with boasting and arrogance and uh, uh, that resulted in evil, and they couldn't believe it. I don't see how, how my arrogant boasting is evil. He says, therefore, and he's gone into a big discussion on this all the way up to verse well, 13, 13 through 17 is the context. He says, but here's the point I'm after. 
He says, therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do. Now, how do you learn it? The will of God. If you, if you read context, you'll see he's talking about the will of God. He that knows the right thing to do by the word of God, doing it is doing it according to the will of God. How do you learn what the will of God is? You have to study the Bible. The word of God takes you to the will of God. The will of God takes you to the doing or the work of it, to doing it. Therefore, the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So Paul is trying to clear this up. This is the problem they have. It's not that they lack knowledge. They didn't lack gnosis. They lacked epinosis. Epinosis. Let me show you. 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy with me, and then we'll go home. There's where I should have heard a bunch of amens. Thank you. Verse 7. And he's been talking about apostate teachers. He says in the last days, difficult times will come. And, and then he talks about false teachings and people. And then he says, and then he's going to give an example of this in, in verse 8. Uh, and he used the Old Testament. That these men who oppose the truth, men of depraved mind, rejected as regarding the faith. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. You don't get it in Cracker Jacks. Verse 7. Now here's the problem. He identifies the problem. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Epinosis. See, they had knowledge. They wouldn't bring it to epinosis. They failed in epinosis. They knew what the word of God. They knew what the word of God. They knew what the word of God said. They knew what the will of God said. They weren't willing to do it. They made up their own ways of what, how they wanted to live the Christian life. They just come up with their own schemes. Well, I think I, I think I will do this. I think I will do that. What's the word of God said? I don't care what the word of God said. I'm still going to do it this way. Yeah, but what, what about the will? I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. They always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? It's a choice. It's a choice. And so what their problem was, wasn't gnosis. Their problem was epinosis. They were learning. They weren't applying. They had the knowledge. They didn't have the practical application. They weren't willing to apply the wisdom of their learning to their life. Listen to me. <laughs> you know I love you. You wouldn't put up with me if there wasn't a love relation going on here. Now I know that. Now I know that. What separates this church from most churches is the way we teach to get it into your life. The practical part. Where you live eat, breathe, and sleep, and worry, and fret, and fuss, and, and what? Why isn't God doing this with me, and why isn't he doing that with me? I understand that struggle. You've got to come out of gnosis into epinosis. You, you've, got to, you've got to hear the word of God. You've got to believe it. Now you've got to live it. Learning is not enough. It's not enough in the faith cycle. Learning is on the side of gnosis. Living is on the side of epinosis. And if you don't have epinosis, then you're going to have agnosia. You're going to have problems. The word of God, categorically taught, is a problem-solving device for your life. I don't care what your problem is, it will solve it. But it ain't going to solve it apart from faith. The faith cycle has got to bring it out of learning into living. It's not hard to learn the Bible. It's tough to live it. You do know that, don't you? Doing the right thing when people are not. 
when people are doing the wrong thing to you and you're told to do the right thing to them, is that not a tough deal? It isn't if you learn to respond to the will of God, if you learn to respond to the word of truth in your soul and not listen to all this mess on the outside of you. Yeah, but if you know what they did to me, what, what would you do, Rod, Adama, if so-and-so did this to you? Well, I know. If I stayed in the flesh, I'd probably took it to a higher level than you're thinking about. But I can't do that. I don't want to do that. God doesn't want me to do that. He does not want me to live in the flesh. He wants me to live in the power of the Spirit. He want, Listen, when you live in the power of the Spirit, you're able to live for the power of the moment, for the power of the moment, where you can just let the word of God seize and take control of that, that which is uncontrollable. He can just seize and take control of it. Put such a peace in your heart. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. <laughs> I want that for me. Every time I get a phone call, I don't want to panic. Every time I hear a thump in another room, I don't want to panic. I'm not going to look. I know you got this under control, Father. I know. I know you have this under control. When you have to call 911, because, Father, I know you have this under control. Apparently, somebody, somebody that's going to transport from point A to point B that needs to hear a prayer, that needs to hear the truth of the Word of God. It's not hard to learn the Bible. It's hard to, it's, listen, it's not hard to learn it. It's hard to live it. And it's not hard if you understand how it works. It's not hard. It's not lived in the power of the flesh. It's lived in the power of the spirit. Stop listening. So many tell you, so many people tell you how you ought to behave. Start listening to the Holy Spirit tell you. Take a lot of pressure off from you. Let's pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, here we are. We wouldn't want to change one thing about our life where it is today. Not one thing. It's, it's a building block. It's paving the road to heaven. This earth and this time on earth is a vapor. <laughs> a vapor. Boy, that word has been misused today, Father. Vapor. It's just a vapor. Just We're all just one breath away from meeting you face to face, and what a glorious day that will be. But we live in the now. We live in the time, and what an opportunity is for us to stop moaning and groaning and complaining. And seizing the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to minister great truth through our life. The will of God that we have learned needs to be applied. Gnosis must become epinosis. And when it does, it becomes Sophia. It becomes wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. And we're a part of it. And what a joyful thing it is to be able to live the wisdom of God under pressure. I pray that for myself. I pray that for my congregation. I pray that we would learn it well enough to share it with others because there are so many that don't have a clue. As my kids say, they're clueless. Why would that be if our life touches theirs? Let's take time and share with them the truth. Let's have a cup of coffee, maybe not just once in a lifetime, but several times. And share the truth, for it is the truth that sets us free. We thank you for that. Thank you for a congregation that comes prepared to study, to learn to live. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.